Time to get underway with the second talk. We are privileged to have Case Cook from Google, who is one of the lead contributors to Kernel uh, Security, to talk to us this morning about the state of Kernel self-protection. Hi, thanks. Um, I, I've been told I should project, uh, so I'll do that. Um, as mentioned, it's, uh, my name is spelled funny, but it's just pronounced case. That's the Dutch spelling. Um, I uh, blame my parents because they named me after my grandfather, but this works. Um, if you want to follow along, I have some links in some places uh, in some of the examples. Um, that's the URL to the, the PDF of these slides. Um, so uh, this presentation is about the Linux kernel. Um, much of what I have to say uh, at the beginning sort of applies to other software in the, the whole software ecosystem, though. Um, there's sort of a rough agenda of what I'm going to cover, some of the background and justification for the self-protection project and, and why I feel passionately about this, uh, and then a little bit about who we are, the bug, bug classes and exploits uh, we're trying to kill, and how you can help if you're interested. Um, so uh, when I'm talking about kernel security for this talk, it's more than just access control or attack surface reduction, or bug fixing, or protecting user space, um, and more about more than just kernel integrity. Um, these are all topics in general kernel security, um, but this is specifically about kernel self-protection, uh, the kernel trying to defend itself from attack. Um, and the reason for this, I don't need to really drive this home, but you know everything is using Linux. Uh, there's two billion active Android devices. Um, now, the downside of this, of course, is the majority are running a 3.10 kernel. Uh, slowly, 3.18 is catching up. Um, last year, this was uh, like 3.4 and 3.10, so that's nice. We're moving forward in time. That's good. Um, <clears throat> but the issue is that uh, bug lifetimes um, on these kinds of devices are even longer than the bug lifetimes that exist in upstream. Um, and sort of talking about the, the lifetime being when it was introduced and when something was solved. And uh, there tends to be a lot of attitude in the upstream kernel uh, society about this is, oh, this is not our problem. They're running such an old kernel. They should use the latest kernel. It's like, okay, fine, but they are still running the Linux kernel. How do we get to uh, a place where even if you're on an old kernel, you're at least somewhat defended? Um, because it's hard to get those bug fixes all the way back to these old devices. You know, it, it would be nice for all of our phones to be running the latest kernel, but we're not there yet. Um, that's a whole other topic. Um, so looking at upstream bug lifetime, um, John Corbett looked at this in 2010 and spent the time to research you know, when was a CVE, uh, you know, a CVE flaw introduced and when it was fixed and figure out the, the lifetime uh, for those bugs. Um, and this is you know, the opportunity an attacker has, basically, between when it was introduced and when it was fixed. Um, I did this again. I, I keep doing this every time I give uh, this presentation, looking at um, this, the Ubuntu CVE tracker. Um, their kernel team does a pretty good job of doing that same research and looking back to see when a flaw was introduced, um, and then obviously when it was fixed. And, um, so the, the numbers here are sort of beginning to creep up to six years on average. And I can show soon why that is. But um, really, we've only had about three critical bugs, but their lifetime is huge. They were introduced, and then five years later, we went, oh, let's fix that. Um, so uh, last time I gave this talk, I told people, hey, all of your machines have a critical bug, and we don't know what it is yet. Uh, turns out that was Meltdown Inspector, but <clears throat> that turns out to be a hardware issue. Um, so I'm not including that in, in my count of software flaws, but still, there is very likely a software flaw right now on all your devices, and we just don't know what it is yet. So it'd be nice to try to contain the, the effect of that flaw. Um, so this unreadable graph is CVE lifetime. So every vertical line um, is a lifetime of a single CVE from when it was introduced at the bottom. Um, to when it was fixed at the top, so time is up and down. You can see the kernel releases in very small text on the side. Um, and then, so red, which you can barely see, are the critical ones, and then orange is sort of high, medium, and low. Um, and really, let's only pay attention to 
uh, the, the critical and high lifetimes. Um, the long red one there it was the dirty cow, um, and that really brought the average up. Um, but you can see it's starting at the, at the, at the uh, right side. It's actually starting, we're starting to see the lifetimes lifting up out of pre-Git history. Um, so I, I was concerned for a while that the average was going to be growing forever uh, because the average was just going to be, well, it was introduced before Git history and now it's, late, it's further along in time from Git history, so the average will just keep getting bigger. We've actually started to see the tail of these coming to lift up out of pre-Git history, so I'm hoping that maybe we'll stabilize this average to six years so that we can start reducing it um, to have our bug lifetimes be even smaller. Uh, and that's mostly about detecting bugs and finding and fixing them. Um, so um, some people will come to me and say, sure, big deal, there was a five-year bug lifetime, but no one knew about it. They couldn't use it, an attacker didn't find those bugs. And I say, well, no, there's, this risk isn't theoretical. We have evidence that attackers are watching the Linux kernel commits, and they tend to be better at finding bugs than, um, than we are at finding them. Uh, and we've had times when they come out in public and say, you know, haha, we found this as soon as we committed and we've been using it for the last five years or whatever. Um, but most attackers are not going to be publicly boasting about this. Um, so uh, it would be, it, it's important to think that it's, it's, it's not theoretical. There is a real thing here. So fighting bugs is good. Uh, we are finding them. I think the, the graphs sort of show evidence of our use of all the static checkers and the dynamic checkers. Um, we're fixing them. There's thousands of fixes going into the stable branches. I think when I looked somewhat recently in the 4.9.49 stable release at the time, there were almost 3,600 patches, which turned out to be about 73 bug fixes per stable uh, release number. Um, so it's very clear we're pulling in lots of bug fixes. Uh, the problem is, of course, they're always going to be around. Um, and they exist whether or not we uh, are aware of them or believe in them. Um, Whack-a-mole isn't a solution. It definitely helps us reduce the number, but we're always going to, we're still going to have, and we're going to keep introducing bugs. Um, so a wonderful analogy was given in the 2015 Linux Security Summit um, by the, the lead admin for kernel.org, where he talks about uh, the 1960s car industry and how there was all this advertising on, it's amazing how well it runs. You drive down the highway and you're not sprayed in the face with, you know, gas and, and coolant and whatever, and it's, everything's great. Um, but of course, at that time, if you blow a tire and run into a tree, everybody dies. Like, it just did not work. Like, it ran really well, but it did not fail very well. And so there was a lot of attention given to safety. Um, and this is where we, we need to make those changes in, in our general software ecosystem and in the kernel in particular. Um, and for the kernel in particular, um, since user space is becoming more and more difficult to attack, if you uh, looked at uh, Jesse Frizzell's uh, keynote today, she's talking about locking down all kinds of stuff in user space with containers and isolation and all sorts of other confinement, this starts to paint a huge target on the kernel itself um, because you must expose some interfaces to the kernel, otherwise you can't get anything done. So, um, you know, getting into the kernel and, and taking, making attacks against it uh, are, is becoming significantly more uh, interesting to attackers. And it's, I don't want to terribly scare anyone, but it isn't hyperbolic to say that lives depend on Linux. Um, like, for example, the 2014 Futex kernel bug was used to root Android devices, but that eventually got re, you know, co-opted by the hacking team group who sold, you know, weapons to oppressive regimes and used that to target their, you know, dissidents and their families. It's like, this is a real, this actually affects people's lives, potentially. Um, that's why I tend to feel pretty passionately about making sure we protect stuff as well as we can. Um, and I want to get Linux caught up. Um, I want this to, to look like this comparison of it's a, a 2009 on the right Chevy Malibu versus a 1959 Bel Air crash test. And the 1959 uh, cabin is just completely smashed. There's nothing left in there. And 2009, the, the cabin is mostly uncompressed. Um, it's a terrible accident, but you know the crash test dummy is surviving that one, but not so much in the other car. So 
I'd like to do the same thing for Linux in specific, but you know, the rest of the ecosystem generally. Um, so killing bugs is nice. Um, uh, Linus Torvalds has a famous quote effectively saying, all security bugs are just normal bugs. And there is truth, there is some truth to that statement. Um, your security bug may not be my security bug, um, your just bug might be my critical security bug, et cetera. And given the variety of bugs available, we don't have a lot of idea of what attackers uh, are gonna be using at any given moment. Um, and bugs might be in out of tree code, not in the main upstream kernel. Um, some on upstream vendor drivers, for example. Um, and again, this is where a lot of the kernel community tends to say, oh, but it's not our problem, it's in out of tree code. It's like, well, sure, but you're providing the infrastructure that that code runs on. Can't we do something to make it harder for people to shoot themselves in the foot to have those bugs exposed in the first place? So I'd rather us kill entire bug classes. Um, then they can't happen again. Um, not even out of tree code can hit them. Um, but we'll never kill all bug classes, that's fine. Uh, we can, however, kill exploitation methods. Um, so if we can eliminate the, the exploitation targets that are used in the kernel, if we can eliminate methods that attackers use to gain a foothold, um, eliminate information leaks, basically anything that assists an attacker, get rid of it, make it as an inhospitable environment as possible. Um, and the, the, the tweak on this, of course, is that we want to do this even if it makes development more difficult. And this has been a huge pushback where you say, ah, oh, but you're adding so much complexity to the kernel. I don't want to have to deal with that. You know, there, there's a lot of pushback on this, um, which isn't an unreasonable argument, but it needs to be weighed against uh, the protection that it provides. You know, you've got, for example, a going back to the car analogy, you've got a, a a car designer who's trying to, oh, I want the lines of the, you know, the exterior of this vehicle to look like this, and I want the window to be, you know, really big over here, and the, the guy in charge of, you know, whoever's in charge of the door design is like, well, no, we've got to have a titanium bar here, so when it gets hits on the side, we don't get crushed, and the designer kind of goes, ah, I've got to work around this, but they're working around the safety concerns uh, for, for that situation. Um, so what's nice is it's, it's rare to have a single bug result in a viable exploit. Um, most attacks are built out of a chain of bugs, so uh, anything we can do to break that chain of finding, you know, finding a target, injecting code, locating that code, and, and running it, like anything, there are gonna be methods and bugs to use to build this whole chain of attack. Anything we can do to break that uh, helps us, so that's another, you know, that's another way of stopping the exploitation. Um, so what can we do about it? <clears throat> We already have defenses uh, that exist in the world, um, and there's a growing concern about improving kernel security, uh, so much so that the Washington Post wrote up an article uh, on this. We've got techniques that exist in, for example, GR security and PACs, which, uh, which have tons of stuff. Um, there's research stuff in academic white papers, like the, the PTI patches recently for, for Meltdown came out of academic research. Um, and a lot of those things haven't ended up in the upstream Linux kernel for a variety of reasons. Um, so after the Washington Post article, I felt, it seemed like it was the right time to really try to push this forward and say there's enough people that, you know, I, I can't do it all alone, um, but if there's enough people interested in this and we can get everyone together and sort of share our ideas and, and work together and test things and develop stuff and work on it, we might be successful. Um, but speaking briefly about out-of-tree defenses, this is what uh, a lot of people have gone to uh, since they didn't, you know, you can only do so much as an engineering group for, uh, on, a, on a kernel that you're using. So some downstream kernel forks that have defenses. For example, um, technically Red Hat's kernel is a fork of the upstream Linux kernel. They had for a while an exec shield uh, series of patches that improved defenses. Um, Ubuntu tends to develop uh, their app armor defenses in Ubuntu first, uh, and then upstream it, um, and that's a fork, it's a distro fork. All distros are a fork, except for like two. Um, Android has, uh, the Samsung Knox has some significant changes to the kernel as well to pro provide some defenses. Then of course, like the granddaddy of them all is GR Security, which has tons and tons of stuff uh, that, they, that they developed uh, as a defense, but all of this is out of tree from a certain perspective. Um, 
Now, if you're only using the kernel, um, let's say you're a web host and you just need a kernel to run and provide you with user space, um, it's much easier to run a fork uh, because you're in a better position. You don't have to cha make changes on your own. However, if you're developing the kernel um, for specific purposes, uh, you know, you're, you're a phone vendor or you run a production service that needs changes to how the kernel works, it's really hard to try to integrate multiple forks. You've got your own fork of things that you want to do, and bringing in other forks tends to be in incredibly painful, and your engineering staff may be limited. Um, so really, putting stuff into upstream is the only way uh, for everyone to get it, uh, and really uh, roll this out to the whole world, you know, in my early slide where I'm talking about Linux being everywhere. Um, so, just a quick digression first, um, totally changing the subject, uh, defending against email spam. So I'll, I'll get to a good point here, I swear. So the client connects, the server accepts that and sends a banner, and we go back and forth with email protocol, um, line at a time, sort of getting through communication. This is normal uh, way to do it. Um, there is a class of spam bots that they just connect and the server accepts it and sends a banner, and then they just dump everything at it without even waiting to see. And then the server sort of processes it a line at a time anyway, and says, oh, hi, okay, yeah, sure, and takes your spam. Um, there's a, a trivial solution to this, which is um, inserting a short delay between connecting and sending a banner. Uh, the client connects, the server accepts and waits, and the client dumps everything because it's a spam bot, and then the server goes, oh, you were talking before the banner arrived. You're not even remotely speaking the correct protocol. Drop the connection. I'm not going to talk to you. And um, like whatever you do first for spam defenses will catch 90% of the spam. So here it is with a you know, virtually no CPU effort. You can drop all of your spam because lots of spam bots are not uh, paying any attention to the actual protocol. Um, that's nice. It's powerful because it's not the default. Um, Bots, if everyone did this, uh, bots would adapt, but they'd be forced to actually implement proper SMTP stacks to get it done, so it sort of drives things up a bit um, as far as the difficulty. Um, but if, if you have a defense that's in a fork um, that's unexamined or only run by a small subset of users, uh, those people gain the protections, uh, but sometimes they haven't been looked at by any, any researchers. You're not certain that they provide the defense that they claim to provide. Um, but on the flip side, having a, a mixed environment does give you some additional resilience. But the point is to get stuff actually in. So to illustrate this, my second digression, um, Stack Clash in 2017. Um, so a lot of the underlying issues for the Stack Clash vulnerability were identified seven years prior. Um, the idea being that if you can control the memory layout of a process, you may be able to manipulate things and, and crash your stack into other things and gain control over set UID processes to elevate your privileges. Um, so in 2010, this was examined and looked at, and uh, you know, the Linux kernel folks said, uh, we'll add like a one-page gap between heap and stack, and we'll be good. Um, and uh, in GR security, um, from 2010 until their last public uh, patch, uh, took it further, and they said, we're uncomfortable with only 4K. I think this should be a lot bigger. Um, we're not sure, but it feels like there's more problems here. Uh, they were correct. Um, so they defaulted to 64K, but you could grow it a whole bunch. Um, it turns out the gap was not enough. Um, this is a snippet of the, of the code responsible uh, for uh, them. An additional piece was that they lowered the size of the stack that was allowed for set UAD processes. So that they had this gap, but they're like they're saying, well, if you're going to try to run a set UAD process, let's stop you from being able to manipulate stack sizes and do all sorts of crazy things to change the layout. You shouldn't be able to do that either. So they added additional protections, um, and it turns out this was incredibly effective against stack clash because you couldn't manipulate the the stack. Um, this worked very well. They were correctly paranoid uh, to, to think of that. Um, upstreaming. That fix, that like four lines or whatever, took you know nine people, 15 patches, landed in 4.14. Uh, still wasn't complete because it only handed one of two cases where this could be bypassed. Um, 
and uh, the fixes for the second problem are on the way. But um, what wasn't considered at the time uh, in, in GR Security's solution was that uh, the stack limit can be changed from outside the process that is execing. Um, so you can start a bunch of threads, and the other thread will start to exec, and then you just keep manipulating the stack until you bypass it. Um, and sure enough, you could do this even on a, you know, a now old GR security uh, system. Um, they found another way to bypass a protection that was in, put in upstream um, that was pointed out by upstream people, but we missed it. Um, so it was still unexamined, but we actually went back and forth to find a proper solution to this. Uh, the point being that out-of-tree defenses really need to be upstreamed. Um, without that back and forth, without the open development, without actually getting it in, you end up in situations where you have um, kind of a maybe defense. It probably works, but have we really looked at it? Has it been widely deployed and shown to actually be um, what it says it is? Um, so again, this isn't universally true, but it sort of illustrates why some tiny change sometimes requires way more work to actually get into upstream. So how do we do this? And that was um, at the end of 2015. Um, after that Washington Post article, I said, all right, let's, let's get together. I posted, I posted to, the, to the kernel hardening mailing list that was pre-existing and started up the kernel self-protection project and said, anyone interested in coding, testing, documenting, discussing, whatever, um, let's get together and, and try to get this done. Um, so these numbers are a little hard to count. I sort of hand wave it, but um, there are a lot of other people also working on things that are about defending user space from user space, you know, kernel assisted um, user space defenses, brute force detection, a bunch of other things like that. Um, the KSPP tends to focus on protecting the kernel uh, from kernel attacks um, from user space rather than protecting user space. So there's about 12 organizations and maybe 10 individuals working on a ever-shifting set of uh, technologies. Uh, it's slow and steady. Uh, it's not a revolution, it is an evolution. Standard, standard comment. Um, this is my eye chart of names. Um, there's lots of other people on this mailing list, but um, I've been working on code and testing and design. Uh, I've probably forgotten some people, um, so please let me know if I failed to mention you or if you've moved between companies or anything else or spelled something wrong, but I really like to point out how many people have, have joined this in some capacity, uh, and I'm hugely grateful uh, to them because uh, we need as much help uh, as we can possibly get. It's a huge bit of work, uh, which I'll now get into. Um, possibly another digression when I talk about uh, the different, two different types of protections, uh, the, the classes, sort of uh, the basic categories for these protections. So, there's probabilistic protections. This is some secret that the attacker does not know. Um, this is weaker than a deterministic protection, uh, based on the naming even. Um, familiar examples are your password. If you share it with someone else, they have access to your stuff. Like, okay, it can be guessed, it can be brute forced, et cetera. This is a probabilistic protection. Uh, the stack protector is a canary value that is randomly created and is supposed to be secret, so an attacker can't use it. Address space layout randomization, the offset can be exposed. It's, again, it's just a probabilistic defense. It makes things more expensive to attack uh, when, you're, when you're trying to develop exploits. Um, better than that are deterministic protections, which is the state of some system that can't be changed. Uh, this, of course, assumes that the system is actually uh, does what it says it does, so <laughs> all my familiar examples here were ruined. Um, Read-only memory, uh, yeah, okay, fine, but Meltdown can't write to memory yet. Um, we'll see. Uh, bounds checking, uh, except uh, Spectre, but in normal world, <laughs> in normal world, read-only memory really is read-only. You can't, unless you, you know, flip it, if you shift it around, then maybe you can write to it. So that's a deterministic protection. And bounds checking, if you try to write past the end of an array, but you just checked how large the array is, like if the code is always checking, that's deterministic. You can't change that. Um, so deterministic protections are, uh, as these slides allude, uh, somewhat more difficult to achieve. Um, but that's the, that's the goal. So shifting now to bug classes. Um, by far the most well understood is the stack buffer overflow. 
Um, there's also stack exhaustion, where you run off the end of stack. Uh, the kernel stack is significantly smaller uh, on x86-64. It's only 16K. It uh, tends to be, uh, doesn't need to be very big normally. Um, but under certain circumstances, you could, in the past, exhaust the stack and do funny things uh, on the other side. So there's a ton of different mitigations about a different, different aspects here. Um, and each of these I forgot to introduce. I'll usually have an exploit example just to try to illustrate some things and list a bunch of mitigations. Um, things that I've gotten bold are stuff that are in upstream, including what version it was applied. And uh, stuff in italics are things that we're trying to work on right now. Uh, and everything else is just sort of notes and examples about where other implementations exist in the world. Um, uh, things like that that, don't, that aren't yet in the upstream kernel but are worth looking at. Um, so we've had stack canaries for a long time, and we've improved them over time. Um, uh, guard pages at the end of the stack, so for stack exhaustion, or, or you'd run off the end of the stack and fault because there's, there's no page at the end of it. Um, that was added pretty recently. And we've removed the delicate things that were at the bottom of the stack, um, moved them away so we can't overwrite them and do terrible things anymore. And we're going to continue with uh, unbounded allocations uh, with like alloc A. Um, that's being worked on. And then there's an, uh, like the conceptual idea of shadow stacks where you can protect returns and other things. And the Clang safe stack exists for this as well. Um, another big bug class is integer overflow uh, and underflow. Um, the, the, one of the biggest places for this uh, tended to be in reference counting in the kernel. Uh, both of these examples are from 2016, um, so I tried to encourage people to spend some time on fixing this, and um, we ended up with a, a ref count overflow protection uh, in 4.11, and we've been slowly converting uh, the atomic counters that were used for reference counting into this reference, this protected refer reference counter now, um, so we can hopefully stem the tide of uh, incoming reference counter bugs, since we were starting to get a lot of them. Um, and for general integer overflow, there's a bunch of different ideas. Uh, a lot of it comes down to compiler instrumentation. Um, Clang has the F sanitize uh, integer option. Uh, there's the PAX size overflow plugin. Uh, but it really comes down to instrumenting the compiler to do the right thing, because it's in the place to go, oh, you're multiplying two things together. Did you think it could wrap around? Um, then there's general buffer overflows. And these can happen in all kinds of different places. There's all kinds of different mitigations. Um, a big one where a lot of problems occurred was copying user in and out of memory, uh, copying memory in and out of user space, uh, and that we could at least isolate to making sure it wasn't going to overrun the buffer it was uh, copying into or out of. Um, there's metadata validation to make sure you didn't clobber something on on the on the heap. Um, fortify source, similar to what uh, was in glib, what is in glibc for checking uh, string copy, mem copy style returns. Um, that tended to catch, when it was added, it caught a lot of overreads, um, which wasn't a big deal, but could potentially put stuff in memory um, that you didn't want there, uh, a weak leak, information leak. Um, format string ingestions is a whole class of attack. Um, the percent %n format string identifier was the only format identifier that would actually perform writes uh, to memory. Everything else was just reading stuff out and reformatting it, whereas percent %n was introduced you know, forever ago. Uh, to perform writes, and that creates a write primitive. So being able to kill the entire bug class of having a format string attack be writable uh, was nice. So some time ago, we managed to just drop percent %n completely from the kernel's printf implementation, um, which makes things nice, except, of course, now format strings can be used to expose information or whatever. But can we get rid of percent %p? Uh, stay tuned. Kernel pointer exposure. So there was a weak version of trying to restrict where this came. Um, and removing visibility of kernel symbols and like proc k all sims, uh, stuff like that. And um, recently, due to a, a lot of work, uh, we got rid of percent %p in the most recent kernel. Uh, Linus seems to have uh, really agreed with the direction for that. <laughs> and, uh, and Tobin drove a lot of it. Um, so now percent %p is a hash. It's not an actual value. So you can compare two numbers, because they'll have the same hash. Uh, but the actual uh, memory location is not, it's not meaningful anymore, um, which was a incredibly large hammer I was not expecting us to see. Um, 
but now we have it, so that's kind of nice. Um, uninitialized variables. This is another one that a lot of people talk about, like, oh, it's, uh, it's just an information exposure bug, or we can't really, you know, it's just uninitialized. We don't know what's in there. It's like, well, no, it's been initialized. Something wrote to it. Um, it's just figuring out how to write to it so that you can have control over it. So I actually made an example of, an, uh, like, an exploitable uninitialized variable where it was a function pointer, so you could gain control of a function pointer and do stuff. Um, I so clearing the kernel stack uh, between syscalls is nice. It can be very expensive, so there's uh, some work from PAX and GR Security that's being ported to try and make this an intelligent uh, clearing, so you only clear as far into the stack as you went during that syscall. Um, that takes a bit of compiler instrumentation. Um, another semi-large hammer is just wiping structures uh, when they're passed down to a function. So for example, compilers normally say, hey, you've got this variable that you didn't initialize and you're trying to use it. Everyone's seen those warnings, but um, it doesn't give you that warning if you pass a variable by reference to a function, because it assumes, well, you didn't initialize it, maybe, maybe that function will initialize it. Um, a funny story, it doesn't always initialize it. So just uh, clearing them all the time uh, was an added uh, feature to a GCC plugin uh, recently. So the by reference clearing um, has stopped at least two information exposures I know of um, since it was introduced in 4.14. So that's a nice mitigation that's already showing some value. Um, use after free is another endemic problem. Um, so again, clearing memory really can help a lot in this because um, it removes the values of certain things uh, that you, the attacker would normally have been depending on still being in memory. Um, Segregating how memory is allocated uh, helps. So, for example, if an attacker has control over allocating one size of memory and the kernel is doing something else uh, at the same size and it frees it, the attacker would then be able to allocate something that's the same size and then it would get used later. But if something where an attacker had control over the size was in separate allocation pools, um, you are not as easy, it is not as easy as an attacker to overwrite the same sized object uh, if you have separated pieces. Um, we're not there yet, there's some good examples of this uh, in PAX. Um, randomizing heap allocations really makes an attacker's job annoying. Uh, it's, again, a probabilistic defense, uh, but it does raise the cost. Um, so exploit methods that we're trying to kill, so finding the kernel. Let's hide where it is somehow. We can hide symbols, we can uh, randomize the base offset, we can do crazy things that don't exist yet in anything but academic papers, which is like randomizing the layout of the kernel internally at boot time. Um, so like moving basic blocks around and functions all around. Um, that requires a lot more overhead. Um, executable but not readable memory. So even if you could scan through memory looking for stuff, you wouldn't be able to scan the kernel text. Um, and there's a, a wonderfully insane per build structure layout randomization uh, plugin that came from GR Security where you just randomize the layout of all the structures. Um, and as an attacker, you have no idea how this was built. Uh, this is less useful on distro kernels since the attacker can just go look at the build seat. But if you build your own kernels, uh, try this. It's crazy. Um, exploitation, direct kernel overwrite. So you get a bug. It uh, lets you write anywhere in the kernel. So just write to the kernel code. This was very possible on many architectures for a long time. I don't understand why this is still a problem in the 21st century, but here we go. So S390 and PA RISC had, had this solved forever ago. Uh, x86 technically had it solved for a long time, but it kept breaking. Um, got it added in ARM in 319, ARM 64 and P4, PowerPC just got it recently. Like, we're coming along, but really, we should just make the kernel itself read-only. Um, Similarly, function pointer overwrites. There's a lot of function pointers everywhere scattered in memory, um, so we want to make those read-only as much as possible. Sometimes there's memory that we only initialize once, right at init. Um, so we added the read-only after init, which was based on PAX's kern exec, which tries to make everything read-only. Um, and we're trying to get a concept of write once memory where you allocate it and initialize and make it read-only, and then you can keep on moving, because there's a lot of stuff like that that occurs uh, even outside of init sections. Um, and then in 4.15, I spent a bunch of time dropping the, um, in, in kernel timers, uh, when you allocate a new timer, you can specify the callback that you want. You know, after a su such and such time, call this function. 
and you'd store it in the heap. And then someone next to you in the heap would have an overflow and overwrite your function pointer, and they could call anything in the kernel. Um, the problem, like this is sort of standard, that's function pointer overwrites. The problem was with timers, the timer not only had the function, it also had the first argument as the next thing. So as an attacker, this gave you a much more elevated uh, tool to get attacks done. And this was totally not necessary. It was just infrastructure in the kernel for making timers, um, but it needed massive refactoring to get rid of this. So you would not pass an explicit data field. You just have the function pointer. Um, that went in, so that kills a number of exploits recently that were using this method in their heap attacks to find a timer in memory, overwrite it, plus over, add an argument, and now they could call an arbitrary function with an arbitrary argument, um, which is almost ROP. Um, exploitation, so you get execute control in the kernel and you just aim the kernel into user space where you have much more control as an attacker over what you want it to do. Uh, stopping this is sensible and nice. There, we've added hardware features and CPUs to fix this. Um, getting this emulated is nice for hardware that don't have those features. Uh, ARM added emulation for this in 4.3. ARM64 added it um, for their uh, 4.10. Uh, strictly speaking, if you have ARM64, you have PXN. But the next slide will clarify this a little bit. Uh, and as a side effect of PTI, you actually get this emulation now in x86 um, because the shadow user space page tables are now marked non-executable when you're in kernel mode. So you can no longer jump into and run user space uh, code, which is great. Um, and then there were compiler instrumentation uh, to like do crazy things like set the high bit on all function calls in the kernel. And that way, if you ended up with a user address, you'd still set the high bit and then jump into bad memory. Um, so there's still user space data access, so you're not executing it, but you're going to read a structure that has been laid out by an attacker in user space memory. Um, so SMAP and PAN uh, are not as widely available. Um, in fact, I don't think I know of any ARM64 hardware that has been, exists in the, in the real world. Uh, that has PAN, so that's the, the same emulation that provides PAN emulation, uh, provides PXN emulation. Anyway, so ARM and ARM64 have this emulation, um, and we can get it for x86. Um, Andy Ludomirsky's talked about this uh, on and off, and I'm hoping that once uh, things die down a little bit with PTI, um, people will have spare cycles to actually look at this. Um, there's some other uh, page frame ownership, uh, exclusive page frame ownership is uh, also important for dealing with the linear map. So there's two copies of memory actually mapped in, in the kernel. So if you can't jump into the normal one, you can jump into the linear map if you know the physical layout. Um, and this would help with that. Um, and then there's ROP and JOP and trying to defend against that. Most of that is compiler instrumentation. Um, there's the Clang CFI. There's KCFI that doesn't, as of yet, I don't think they've got a public version of it. Um, and then there's uh, Pax's GCC plugin uh, that does a bunch of this on x86 as well. Um, so there's a lot of work for us to do. Um, so I'm going to go really quickly. I have links to stuff we added in 4.10, 4.11, 4.12, uh, 4.13, 4.14, and what we've got coming in 4.15, which did not release on Monday, uh, or on Sunday, this last Sunday, which we were expecting, but it didn't happen. So I have all of this week to write a blog post on what's in 4.15, and I did not yet write it yet. So anyway, um, some, some big deals, I think, uh, that we're going to see a lot of, obviously, PTI and Retpoline, but you know, this has been talked about forever, everywhere. Um, I think uh, percent p-hashing is going to be uh, rather disruptive, um, but will stop, I mean, it will stop information leaks that are being used that way. Um, Maybe in 4.16, we'll get the last of the ref count T conversions. We've slowly been trickling them in, if you saw that go by really fast. Um, user copy whitelisting. So the hardened user copy basically said, you can't copy to and from a heap allocation if you're outside the size of that heap allocation. But as it turns out, very little of heap allocations need to go in and out of user space at all. Usually it's one field or a couple fields in the middle of the structure. So the whitelisting basically says, here, I know I'm going to copy this one or two fields out of this allocation. And that actually gets you, you can, like, in, in running, on a running system, 85% of, of slab memory is no longer able to be copied in and out of user space. It's just a tax surface reduction. Um, that's really nice. 
And I was um, super frustrated recently by the Blueborn attack, um, which was protected trivially by stack canaries, and nobody had turned on stack canaries where it mattered. And I couldn't understand until I once again took a look at config CC stack protector, and like it's just really irritating to turn it on. So I think we've solved this so that you get auto. And if your compiler supports it, it turns it on and you're done. We've got a lot of other stuff coming. Um, uh, stack leak plugin, page frame ownership. Um, kernel ASLR on ARM might be interesting. Um, I mentioned this, map emulation x86. Um, some other things out of user space protection that I would like to see just because it's come up time and time again. The brute force protection. Um, crazy stuff like link time optimization where uh, the, all of the kernel is linked in one pass at the end by the compiler, lets you do crazy things with CFI. Um, removing other common things, uh, read-only page tables, hard and allocator, maybe hypervisor magic. Um, we've seen a lot of hypervisor work in other places. Um, we've got a lot of challenges. Um, conservatism, we've had you know, 16 years uh, it took to accept the symlink restrictions that went into upstream by multiple people. Um, the responsibility, like as kernel developers, we have to accept the need for uh, these changes and our, the sacrifice of some, you know, we must accept the technical burden of it. Um, and out of tree developers we work with sort of have to understand how the kernel is developed. It's, it's slow. Um, and we've got the complexity uh, of these changes can be daunting, um, but we've still got room to innovate. Uh, need to collaborate with a lot of people, and we need dedicated developers, reviewers, testers, and backporters. Um, and that's basically it. Uh, you can get the slides there if you want to contact me um, there or join the project and, or, or watch us or whatever. But um, happy to take questions. Thanks very much, Case. We have four minutes for questions. Okay. I remind you to repeat them. OK, yes. Uh, the uh, attempting to summarize the question is um, uh, there appears to be a lack of good security practice documentation in the kernel. Hopefully I'm getting this right. Um, and it would be nice to have one place for developers to go for common questions like, is this safe to pass a function pointer around on the stack? Um, and, and things along those lines. Um, I agree. I would love to see more documentation. Um, if anyone, please step up and do that. I would, I would greatly appreciate it. It's why I talk about uh, some, of the, some of the contributions are not coding. Um, it's testing, it's writing, it's uh, anything you can think of. There's a lot of work to be done here. It would be very nice. I agree. Yeah. Uh, the, the question, the question is, um, uh, while I have statistics on the lifetime, have I created any extrapolation of how many bugs may exist in the kernel? Is that accurate? Um, I haven't tried to do that statistical analysis. Um, I'm not a statistician. It would be interesting to find out. Um, uh, you could probably correlate it. Uh, yeah. Um, I'll throw out my estimate. Okay. Okay, uh, that was three. That was uh, th three bugs per thousand lines of code. Is that right? Yeah. And that gets to what? Uh, oh, so we have sixty to seventy thousand bugs in the kernel. There you go. <laughs> That's a low estimate. Though a low estimate, though by hopefully by the the graph of high you know, critical, high, medium, and low. Hopefully, that's very few of those are critical, but they're there. <coughs> So I'm curious, uh, are we making the kernel undebuggable? Uh, His primary role is investigating failures. I mean, if right. we really have a different address layout on each device, which is one of the things you mentioned, how am I supposed to solve a problem? For yeah, uh, the question is how do, how do we, <coughs> is this making the kernel harder to debug? And uh, the, the short answer is yes. Uh, <laughs> The, that's part of the technical burden, sort of accepting the defenses. Um, but the goal with all these defenses is to try to find a way to still make it useful to debug. The problem is, 
Debugging a kernel and attacking a kernel tend to share a lot of the same needs and constraints, um, which is why it's nicer to kill exploitation methods because that's just artifacts of how the kernel was made uh, helping an attacker. So if we get rid of those, it doesn't affect debuggers um, and it irritates attackers. So with that, we must call the session to, the, to a close. We will reconvene here at 1.40. Let's thank Thanks. Case again. Thank you.